Yeah. My students are about 12 from us yeah. uh, from a fall class that I have uh, at Geneseo. And the same thing with Dr. Chislock at Brockport. He has his class and their students have posters. And then we have Jacqueline Malinowski from our geological sciences department who did uh, a very interesting research project in the lake this summer with help from LA uh, working off the CLA boat. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to let the students speak to you. And um, thank you again for this fantastic opportunity for us. It's wonderful that the students get to see their research, uh, the meaning of their research to the public uh, right away. So this is and giving us this uh, opportunity. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to introduce you. Uh, and it's Matthew, Dean, uh, Caitlin, and Laura. I didn't know Caitlin was here. And they're going to be talking about, oh, the title of their talk is Our Cyanobacteria Increasingly Dominant in Tunisia Lake. And here they are. Here's Laura. Hello. Okay, so in this study, we wanted to analyze whether cyanobacteria are becoming increasingly dominant in Canisius Lake by comparing samples that we collected earlier this semester to historical data. So cyanobacteria are a group of phytoplankton and phytoplankton are tiny, tiny photosynthetic uh, organisms that drift through the water. And they could be harmful to the lake community because they form large toxin producing, producing colonies um, and these colonies are one of the main contributors to harmful algal blooms. And this can uh, contribute to the greenish color in the lake and also can be fatal to some organisms if ingested. So as shown by the bar graph in figure one, all the way to the left, um, cyanobacteria have been, uh, been becoming increasingly dominant in Canisius Lake over the past several decades. Uh, specifically, you could see this, their cell count drastically increased in 2004 and 2014. You could see the blue bars spiked up. And this is consistent with the increase in the water temperature after 2004, as cyanobacteria thrive in warmer waters. Um, the green line or the green bar in the graph represents microalgae, which is a type of diatom for, to show for compa comparison. So although annually the temperature of Canisius Lake has increased, seasonally the temperature fluctuates, which affects the distribution of nutrients and phytoplankton biomass. So as winter approaches and the surface level of uh, the surface level of the water starts to cool, it becomes denser and starts to sink. This causes lake mixing. And this causes a shift away from cyanobacteria dominance, more towards the diatoms, which is the green bar shown in the graph. So overall, the goal was to study the phytoplankton community in Canisius Lake in September and October 2021 to determine if there was increasing evidence, uh, if, there per, if there was evidence for increasing cyanobacteria dominance during this rapidly changing phase of the lake's annual cycle. Hello, everyone. My name is Matt. Um, let's see, I'm going to. Um, for the procedure, we took uh, vertical net samples to take a look at the phytoplankton. These samples were looked at under the microscope and keyed up to calculate the relative abundance. Now, for the relative abundance, we did it on the basis of individuals and uh, colonies, not cell number. And now, uh, Dean, can continue on with the results. Hello, I'm Dean. All right, for our, our results, you can see the three graphs that we made. And the first two graphs were the data taken from them was in early and middle of September. And the last graph is from late October. The first two graphs show a high concentration of cyanobacteria, while the last graph shows a high concentration of diatoms. And this is primarily because of the warmer water temperature in the, September, in the month of September, while the diatoms are usually um, more abundant in late October when the water temperature has gone down. And that's due to the lake turnover and the cooling effect that it has. 
All right, now back to me. So we have seen there have been a constant progression of cyanobacteria described since 1999, and our findings this year continue that trend. Um, this increase is most likely due to the warming happening in Canisius Lake over the last 20 years. And because cyanobacteria tend to thrive in warmer conditions, which have led them to become very prevalent in Canisius Lake. <clears throat> However, there has been big gaps in the studying of phytoplankton in Canisius Lake and more frequent samples and studies yearly could be used to better assess long-term trends and biomass as the lake warms. I think we're all good. All right, so Thank you. we'll move on to our next group. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? All right, send in the plankton dynamics and evaluation of turtles. Yeah, send them in. Hi, everybody. That was a little quicker than I anticipated. Sorry, I'm out uh, looking at posters uh, outside. Um, we tried to intersperse the groups. So the next set of speakers that are going to be coming in in a second are from, uh, from SUNY Brockport, and they've been doing a bit of work up uh, down actually in Noon Lake, um, studying some of the same, same things that we study in Phoenix Lake. Um, okay, I didn't see any questions on the chat. This project that you just heard a little bit about, uh, about um, cyanobacteria, we're hoping to be able to continue that this summer. The last time that we did a really thorough study of the uh, algae in the lake, the microalgae and the cyanobacteria was 2014. Dr. Makarowitz, who by the way, I think is in our audience today, uh, has uh, researched this for many years in Kinesis Lake and um, it's, it's due time that maybe we do it a little more frequently because of these potential changes in the, uh, in, the, in the phytoplankton community uh, where we're starting to see more of these cyanobacteria blooms. So um, um, this is something that uh, we do with funding from, from the state through the Livingston County Planning Department. Uh, and um, I hope we can continue uh, along those lines. Anyway, zoom into the screen by pre while presenting. Uh, I don't really know. Uh oh, let's see. Let me uh, let me talk to Carl, Carl Hannifin, uh, to see if there's a way to zoom in on the posters. Uh, it's got to be because they're on PDF, so maybe there is a way that we can use the software uh, that's showing the poster to zoom in and out. But um, I'll be right back. Uh, you guys take a break, and we'll get the next presentation going. Wow. Okay. Um, someone's gonna start over there. And we hope to zoom in on certain areas if you hit command O. Well, right now I want to forward to the next poster. That's the one. That's it. Okay. Command L. Command L. No. That just spins it. Yeah, just turn it. You guys sit down. Go ahead and start. Oh, oh there we go. But that's upside down now. Oh. <laughs> no. Command. There you yeah, go. Did you zoom in? Yeah. Is it command plus and command minus. Is okay. You might, to, you might be able to grab it with the uh, mouse. I don't know. To move it up and down. If yeah, you move it around. I gotta get the cursor there. Let's see. If you, if you don't have the pan here, the space bar should be. Yeah. 
Even that's better, said. That's better? Okay. Yep. Let's Good. go ahead then. You're starting with that. All right. Sorry, man. You go ahead and sit down. Uh, the next group uh, presenting uh, are from uh, SUNY Brockport. They're going to be talking about the plankton dynamics and evaluation of trophic, trophic state trends uh, in Moon Lake. So we have Noah, Anthony, Caitlin, and Matt. Enjoy. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Noah. I'm here with my group members, uh, Kate, Anthony, and Matt off the side. You guys might not be able to see them. Um, our group focused on, as was mentioned, uh, assessing trophic states and uh, zooplankton community compositions in Loon Lake. Um, essentially, we broke down into two subset groups. Me and Matt focused primarily on TSI calculation, um, and then Kate and Anthony focused on the zooplankton community. Um, the main reason and objectives that we had for you know wanting to assess these values is uh, we wanted to determine the trophic state values over the last 21 years uh, for Loon Lake to see if there were any major changes in the system. Um, and then we also wanted to compare some fall data we collected this year to those summer means that have been collected over you know, the past couple decades. Um, yeah, I'll pass it off to Anthony here. So Kate and I examined six uh, zooplankton samples from Loon Lake between April of 2021 and November of 2021. Our goal was to establish daphne and copepod densities along with the average zooplankton length for each sample. So what we were really interested in trying to see was if we could identify any seasonal variation um, within the zooplankton assemblages that are present in uh, Loon Lake. So zooplankton were obtained by a by using duplicate toes from an 80 micrometer zooplankton net. And once we obtained the zooplankton, they were preserved in ethanol until they were ready to be analyzed. For the Daphne and copepod densities, we took two subsamples from each sample and counted the number of animals that were present in each subsample. For the average length of the zooplankton, I measured the first 100 randomly encountered zooplankton, and that was also done for each of the six zooplankton samples. And, uh, as Noah mentioned, uh, we looked at from the years 1997 to 2018, that uh, 21 year time span, we pulled data from the Citizen Statewide Lake Assessment Program or CSLAP reports. And the data that we pulled was uh, total phosphorus, chlorophyll A, and psychic depth measurements. And we pulled those because that's the data that you use to calculate the trophic state index, which is just a way to estimate the, like, the total weight of any living biological material that can be found in the water body. And during this fall, in early November, in Limnology Lab, we also collected those same three data points, total phosphorus, chlorophyll A, and psychic depth. And we, all, we just, uh, Described by the methods of Carlson and Simpson for those calculations. Okay, so going over figure number two, uh, this figure demonstrates copepod and daphnia densities as well as secudaph. Uh, so, as you can see, daphnia is represented by the blue line, and copepods are the orange line. Um, so Daphnia ended up being the most abundant, which was expected. And Daphnia were most abundant in August, whereas copepods were the most abundant in November. Um, and then for the gray line, that represents like water clarity. So how far you can see into the water. And an interesting relationship we found was that the gray line and the orange line, so copepod and succudep, were inversely related. So as copepod density increased, succudep or water clarity decreased. Um, and then as for figure four, we found that uh, for the average zooplankton length, they were the longest in July and they were the shortest in November. So the graph kind of forms a curve and the zooplankton ended up being the biggest in the growing season months, which have the longest photo period and the days are the warmest, which is what we expected. 
And then for figure three, that's just an image of the primary Daphnia species that we were looking at. Um, but we didn't identify the Daphnia to species that was necessary for this project, while the Daphnia, which is the most abundant zooplankton, were uh, the most abundant. So. And then regarding me and Matt's uh, results here, obviously, as mentioned before, um, we, our main objectives were to calculate a TSI value for each year uh, using those data points we harvested from CSLAP. Um, do the same thing for our fall data that we collected and just note any comparisons there. Um, obviously, as you can see in our results section, there are chlorophyll A T, uh, TSIs, phosphorus TSIs, and secchi uh, disk TSIs all were significantly, not significantly, but slightly higher uh, in the fall than they were in the summer, um, which is you know something that's not super in depth, obviously, because we didn't have as much data for the fall collection as we did during the summer, but it's still interesting to know. Um, and then regarding our overall uh, changes in TSI values over time, obviously in the summer months, as you can see down in our figure on the bottom left here, those have been pretty stable uh, over the past 21 years. Yeah. As Noah just mentioned, if you look on the left-hand side to figure one, uh, especially if you look at the blue and gray lines representing total phosphorus and second depth calculations, though over the 21 years, they've remained pretty stable. But the orange line on the top represents the chlorophyll A concentrations, which have definitely fluctuated more, especially in 2007 and 2009, when they spiked into the green portion, and in 2015 and 16, when they dipped into the blue portion. And the blue portion representing a more oligotrophic classification, which just means like a lower productivity, and the green more eutrophic, higher productivity, which means the yellow span in the middle, the uh, mesotrophic, kind of in between both of those. And over the past 21 years, for the most part, the lake stayed in that yellow category in the middle. So I think uh, as, as far as uh, our information here, that's pretty much everything we have. Um, we'd like to open up to uh, any questions as soon as I do a few acknowledgements here. Um, we're having a minor problem. We can't actually see our, uh, uh, so it's zoomed, in, it's zoomed in a little bit too much here. Sorry about that. Yeah, so first, just like to thank the uh, New York State Federation of Lake Associations for allowing us the use of their publicly available data. Uh, we'd like to thank, thank Alice Publo for allowing us to use her property to access Loon Lake, uh, Paula and Bernie Toma for allowing us to use their kayaks and canoes, and Riley Lindbergh and Jenna Inglis for the collection of the zooplankton samples. And as far as uh, we go, that's all we've got. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, come in and close the door. There we go. All right, everyone. Hope you're uh, hanging in there. Looks like we have something growing on the screen. Uh, our next project is back to uh, Canisius Lake. And um, it's a study of, uh, it's a really great group of tiny little organisms. Uh, it's the study of the depth distribution of the tiniest animals in Canisius Lake. And uh, 
speaking to you, uh, and describing this poster to you will be Paige and Jacob. So I'm gonna just bring them right up. Hello, I'm uh, Jacob Michelle. I'm a student from SUNY Geneseo, and we did a study determining where rotifers are found in Phoenicia's Lake. Now, rotifers have always been in Phoenicia's Lake, but recently their presence has been more important than ever with the colonization of zebra mussels. Uh, rotifers eat phytoplankton, and zebra mussels are primary competitors as well primary primary competitors as well as predators of rotifers. Um, so we took samples from one, three, five, nine, thirteen meters, and eight to let you know what the results were. So to start off with, we looked at seasonal trends of the picoplankton blooms and increasing rotifer abundance. So picoplankton are single-celled cyanobacteria, which are mainly what rotifers consume, not the halves that you see before after picoplankton blooms. And you can see figure two, the trends of increasing picoplankton and increasing rotifer abundance kind of match up date-wise. So we took that to mean that the rotifers are probably consuming those single cell blooms that are occurring in the top seven meters. And we went on to see where rotifers were actually found vertical distribution wise to see if this was even a possibility. And this distribution of rotifers has never actually been studied in Canisius Lake. So it's a pretty neat study to do. Um, we did find that both individual species of rotifers and rotifers as a whole were all found in the upper five meters of the lake, which do match up with the picoplankton bloom trends. And you can see in the picture down at the bottom, that's actually a single-celled cyanobacteria bloom in Canisius Lake, I think from July. And those are what we're seeing come up more July and August for the past couple of years in Canisius. And then up in the top right of our poster, that is vertical distribution of rotifers, total rotifers in Canisius Lake for different dates that we sampled. And again, they were found in the upper five meters of the lake. So this still matches up with the trend of them possibly consuming these single celled cyanobacteria that are in And Jacob will now describe the conclusions we had. So rotifers have been consistently abundant since the colonization of zebra mussels. And with this, we've seen increase in single cell blooms as well as halves. Um, really, the best way to fully understand like, what these relationships will determine for the future is to have another study that will examine like what are the feeding rates of rotifers on these phytoplankton. That's a good question. Are there any questions? Yeah, thank you for your time as well. I'm not sure if I my question came through, but how, how did you collect rotifers? Oh, so with the use of the Van Dorn model, which is like this uh, container that you can kind of like capture a 2.2 liter sample with, we would just drop that down to a specific depth and then close the sides. And what were they filtered through? Uh, originally nothing, but as we would- Yeah, yeah we, we collected them in a- We collected them in a bucket and then we'd run them through like this uh, a microscopic filter. 31 micron filter. 31 micron filter. <laughs> and uh, what you were left with would be pretty much rotifers and crustacea. Oh, thank you. Is that Joe? Hey, Joe! Yeah, hi, Sid. How you doing? <laughs> good, good. Yeah, we used uh, about six liter uh, samples for these, uh, for the rotifers. Oh, very good. We also did net samples uh, for the bigger study that we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it looks like interest, an interesting distribution. It does. Yeah, very good. Let's see, other questions. Good job, guys. Okay, we're all set. All right, we're going to uh, move on. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And then the next group. All right. Um, so we're back to uh, studies from other uh, other lakes. And so the next group 
of students uh, are um, from SUNY Brockport. They're going to be talking about the impacts of dredging on microplastic abundance in the Genesee River. And uh, I'll let you introduce yourselves after they're finished uh, answering questions as well. We're going to take a, a little break and get the next group set up. So we'll be about five minutes before we get going again. Perfect. And I'll be back. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Patrick Stetzel. I'm Jared Ludwig. Uh, and we will be talking to you today about the uh, impact of, oh, I'm so sorry about that. It would appear that I have made uh, some type of mistake down here on this sheet here. Uh, could you grab him really quick? Grab him. Yes. There it is. I wonder if you can hit back maybe. Oh, I'm so sorry, everybody. There was a slight technical difficulty here. The, it disappeared. <laughs> Your presentation disappeared? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. It's close to this. We're backwards. Oh, and there it is. Right there. Can right, we, we uh, move this out of our, I don't know, I don't know if there's a good spot for it. Or maybe up here. Mm -hmm. All right. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that, everybody. We are we are back now. Uh, so as I was saying, my name is Patrick. This is Jared. We study the impact of microplastic abundance in the Genesee River. So uh, there is a lot of attention given towards plastic pollution. We are all very aware of it being a bad thing for the environment. And a lot of that attention is given to macroplastics, uh, or these are large plastics that we're very familiar with, such as water bottles, to-go containers, um, you know, plastic bags, these type of things that make our life very convenient. And so while those get the intention, microplastics are another division of plastics that I believe are just as important uh, to recognize and is actually now, as of the last... Uh, 20 years or so is becoming a bit of an emerging science. Uh, so microplastics are technically considered to be low density synthetic organic polymers that are less than five millimeters in diameter. And they're used in things such as cosmetics, uh, personal care products, and also as industrial abrasion uh, replacements for sand. So uh, the two most popular, uh, uh, most familiar things that people will know is going to be the microplastic beads that are used in exfoliants, uh, as well as uh, sandblasting media. Uh, both of those are micro beads. So I think it's important to talk, talk about the life cycle of those before we go into any further. Um, so we're going to address your attention now down to this life cycle that we have here of a microplastic, uh, which starts out as a crude product of gas and oil. And then it separates into uh, really three distinct categories. The first is the large plastics we're familiar with which those end up into higher trophic level organisms uh, or charismatic species that we're familiar with, right? We all know that straws are bad for turtles. Uh, but the two, there are two other categories. The first is gonna be primary microplastics. These are the things that uh, are used in exfoliants as well as the aforementioned sandblasting media. But then there's also secondary plastics. And these come from one of two sources. They're gonna come from the actual byproduct of uh, production of these plastics into getting them to the right shapes but also from the degradation of these larger plastics. So say a water bottle is thrown on the side of the road, it will sit there for quite some time if nobody picks it up and UV rays will degrade it to a point where uh, physical abrasion processes will then uh, break that down. And so those can then be washed down into sewers, uh, just, as, just as likely as micro beads that you're washing your hands with end up into sewers. So now that we're in sewers, you have both of these types of plastics, primary and secondary, and they'll go one of two ways. The most common path is for it to go straight to a wastewater treatment facility where the water will be filtered and then turn into sewage sludge. The problem is, is that most processes for uh, wastewater management are not the most effective at filtering out these microplastics because they're so small and they're low density, they'll float right over the top. Uh, so we're talking about up to 80% is removed 
Uh, and that will all end up, that remaining 20% will end up in sewage sludge. When filtering water, studies in Italy have shown that uh, up to 90% is effective of filtration, which means that in some lakes, 10% of microplastics will end up in drinking water. And this is publicly available water. So that'll end up right into us. Uh, <laughs> so if we're going back now to the sewage sludge, that'll be picked up and, and used in agricultural fields and eventually run off from high precipitation events into surrounding watersheds. So that's one path for it to get into the water. The other is gonna be during high, these similar high precipitation events, uh, urban areas will just release raw sewage into waterways. And when those are released uh, into rivers, streams, or lakes, they'll settle into benthic environments and ultimately be consumed by these uh, benthic level consumers, um, you know, such as invertebrates. And while they're in that soil and being consumed, they'll pick up persist persistent organic pollutants, which when those organisms are then consumed by things uh, such as fish in littoral zones, uh, they'll just stay in the fish for its entire life. And then once those fish keep moving up the trophic levels, it'll eventually be eaten by birds or mammals. And ultimately these plastics could end up in humans, these microplastics. Uh, and although this may seem like a far-fetched concept that doesn't happen here, it actually happens right in our backyard. So, yep, as Patrick said, right in our backyard. So I'm sure many of you have been to the Genesee River <clears throat> located in Rochester. So that was the primary focus for our study. So uh, in the Genesee River, uh, a lot of the sediment there has been polluted from uh, silver metals. Uh, this is primarily from the Kodak Company, and the DEC has been looking to remediate uh, these actions. So they've been dredging these areas. And one of the main focuses of our studies was to look at the differences of microplastics compared uh, from the undredged to our dredged locations, as you see in our map here, figure one. So we were thinking if they're removing some of these sediments in these dredged areas, the microplastics, hopefully, I mean, out of a consequence, will go with them with these contaminated sediments. So we're looking to see if there was any change in uh, microplastic abundance there. And they were also looking to quantify the amount of microplastics in these areas, along with uh, the characteristics of these microplastics. So as Patrick said, I mean, we have fibers and microbeads and fragments and trimmings. So we were looking to see what was going to be the most abundant shape or type of microplastic. And so to do this, what we did is we collected sediment samples from these six different sites here. And one of the most important ones we looked at here was right outside of our stormwater outflow, uh, located in the red. And we were looking to see is if as Patrick was saying, if these raw sewage outflows contain a lot of these microplastics, we should see a large abundance here. And so that was another one of our objectives. And so what we did is we took a subsample of our samples and we dried these. And then what we did is we created a, a salt solution and we suspended these low density microplastics, which we were then able to filter off. And then we could look underneath a microscope to quantify and also qualify these uh, microplastics. So when we look at our results here, what we, well, what we did find here is we did not find a difference between our dredged and undredged areas. But one thing that we did want to bring notice to is looking at right outside our stormwater outflow at the undredged two location. So right outside the stormwater outflow, we see that there is a large abundance of microplastics higher than uh, any other location, which is confirming what we thought was a point source uh, location for these microplastics. And also when we look at um, undredged one, which is upstream of this stormwater outflow, we don't see this large um, abundance of these microplastics. And then also we looked at uh, the abundance and what was the most abundant in these areas. So we found that these beads and fibers were the most abundant in our sample locations. And so what this means here is these are our primary uh, microplastics. And what that means is our consumer products, so our uh, exfoliants, our hand washes, and also our clothing uh, is a large contributor to these microplastics in the water, which is important for consumers to take notice of and think about when they are purchasing these, product, uh, these products is what, is the, what are the consequences? I mean, you might not think about it. You're washing your hands, make your hands smell good. I mean, all is great, but then where are those micro beads going once they uh, are washed off and go out into the drain? And also, uh, lastly here, looking at 
our shoreline to dredge site. So well, we have a high abundance here compared to our other locations. And so what we believe happened here is what we, we sampled right outside of the dredging zone. And so they dredged these areas, not only for uh, the soil contamination, but also for navigation wise. So for vessels that move up the uh, channel for commercial purposes. So we believe that we sampled right outside of the dredged area. And this means that there's microplastics there. And when we sampled in that dredged area, there was, there was none. So it's confirming also that the dredging is having a significant impact on uh, the microplastic abundance. And we just wanted to bring um, notice to some of our results that are limited. And we would like to, in a future study, take a look at um, the spatial distribution of the microplastics in the river. Do you see that we have one up by what we uh, believe to be the point source is our stormwater outflow. And then as we move down uh, the river towards uh, Lake Ontario, we see a lower abundance. So it would be uh, beneficial to get a better spatial uh, distribution. And then also a temporal distribution where we have these large uh, precipitation events and water runoff in the spring. After the snow melt, it would be uh, important to quantify how many or how much uh, microplastics are coming from uh, these waterways and this water water. Yeah, and so at all of our sites, we found microplastics, which means that they are prevalent and they could create an issue. Uh, so there are things that we can do. The most obvious is reduce, reuse, recycle. Secondary plastics, although take much longer to enter the system than primary microplastics, they're a legacy contributor of plastics because there are still going to be uh, the production of larger plastics for a long time. So what we can do is just very simply reduce, reuse, recycle. Uh, I know it seems obvious, but it's definitely pertinent to what we're talking about today. Other things uh, specific to microplastics is we could use permeable pavements on roads, as well as install bioretention cells near these roads, uh, which means during these high water events, uh, the plastics will be caught, which then we could use mechanical removal themselves. Small businesses also, uh, as well as large businesses, have access uh, to these types of programs, which could help them to uh, monitor their plastic pollution. Operation Clean Sweep by the American Chemistry Council is one of those. Uh, and as this is an emerging science, we're increasing the efficiency of our uh, washing machines, both for the home and an industrial level. So keeping that in mind. Um, and, it, it, and you know, microplastics were banned by the United States in uh, 2017 is when the process started, but it was, or 2015 is when it started and 2017 is when it uh, was supposed to be fully enacted by, but we still are seeing these sources as, as companies have ways to get around there to save money. Um, and so I think what I'll finish with is that because this is an emerging science, um, the most important thing that we can do right now is continue to collect data. And the more data we have, the better we'll be able to uh, guide management efforts regarding microplastics in the future. Uh, that's what we have for you uh, all today. Uh, thank you for being here for our presentation and we're very uh, open to presentation or any questions that you have for us. Do you know why the river is dredged and who is dredging? Yes, so the river is dredged for two uh, main reasons. Uh, so the New York uh, State DEC, they acknowledged that there was silver contamination from the Kodak company when they were uh, in business there along the river and they were dumping uh, silver contaminants into the river. So when they uh, tested the area for not only the sediments but also the aquatic organisms, they found high amounts of these silver contaminants. So they identified the most contaminated regions in the river and they developed a plan, the DEC, to remediate some of these soils and remove the soils, replace it with fresh soil that was uncontaminated and also to reintroduce some of the native plants and other uh, organisms in that area. As well as to help keep the channels open. That's another part to it too, yes. Uh, yes, so one of the biggest ones is in the same realm as large plastics is uh, it can impose, the question asked was, do you know of a few of the major health concerns related to microplastics? Uh, one of them is just physical uh, uh, obstruction in consumption. There's also been studies done that shows that uh, the presence of microplastics can uh, um, 
imitate the feeling of being full all the time, which could reduce uh, overall feeding habits. Uh, microplastics are also subject to uh, the adhering of uh, persistent organic pollutants on their surface. And so those, when they end up into higher tier trophic organisms, such as fish, they have been uh, observed to uh, um, uh, impede on endocrine function, which ultimately uh, would kill the fish. But I will mention too, it is a still a, a rather young science. So there is ongoing uh, studies all the time that are popping up as of late regarding microplastics. Any other questions? Don't be shy, we're open for us. <laughs> I think that's it. Thank you all for attending. Yes, thank you. Have a good one. Thank you. Hello, Sid. No, no one's coming. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for your attention so far. We have four more posters to present to you, but at this time, we're going to uh, take a five minute break uh, to catch our breath and to allow you to do the same. And um, we'll come back at 7.20 and, um, and begin with the next set of presentations. So I hope to see you right back here in a few minutes. How's it going, Charlie? How's it going? Hi, Mary. How are you? Hi, darling. Good. I miss seeing you. Yeah, I know. I miss you too. Things well, are easy. Trying to adapt to my new position. Was it mindfully chosen? Or did you mindfully select, or was it chosen for you? Well, uh, kind of both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we had uh, we had quite a few retirements and things changed down. So, yeah. um, luckily, I'm not going to be in that position much longer. About 18 months, and then I'll be retired. Oh my! And you did you join tonight? Because Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> the first I've got to share screens. Oh. <laughs> Let me double check, make sure that's still in the No, it's not. Okay. Can I can uh, access that monitor. Oh, okay. Never mind. <laughs> we're, we're good. I think, I think you're unmuted, um, so you guys can go. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, so we're Geneseo students, uh, and we're, we're Geneseo geology students. And so this past summer, continuing to this semester, we've been doing uh, research on Canisius Lake cores. 
Uh, so the goal of our project was to study a, uh, it was to create a sedimentary archive of the lake to um, determine the human impact before and after colonization, before and after industrialization, and before and after remediation efforts took place. Um, so we did that on Misha's Lake. And so to do this, we uh, went out onto the lake with a boat graciously provided by the Canisius Lake Association, and we took Piston and Bolivia cores. So the Piston cores create um, a, the Piston creates a suction in the core tube and so we pushed that down into the water into the sediment and we pulled it back up and then we went back in uh, for shallow cores with a bolivia core which goes into the same pool and gets uh extra 10 20 centimeters of sediment under that so that we get even more data and so we took the cores back to geneseo and then we brought them to syracuse university where they cut them in half um, and they were evaluated for magnetic susceptibility and XRF data, which tells you the abundance of certain elements um, throughout the whole core. Uh, so then we took our half of the core back, we uh, subsampled it for a subsampled it and digested the sediment in uh, nitric acid. And we took the digested uh, nitric acid and made slides of them. And so we're currently and did a look at um, the slides to count the number of diatoms and look at the genera of diatoms. Uh, we also uh, subsampled for loss of loss of ignition, um, which we put into a really hot oven, 550 degrees Celsius, 500 degrees Celsius, where um, it burns off all the carbon, so we could evaluate the amount of organic matter in um, this sample of the course. Okay, so. Um... I'm going to talk about the results section. So if you look at figure four and figure five, there's, uh, we have our initial core descriptions. So figure four is the, um, the deep south basin and five is the shallow um, south basin. So um, if we look in the results section, um, you'll see we have like the uh, XRF data um, graphed. And if you could take a look at the, um, shallow core at about 110 centimeters there's a pretty steep increase and then about at 93 centimeters there's another pretty steep increase um we are attributing this to um uh uh gosh <laughs> settlement um european settlement and then um the second uh increase we're attributing to uh, industrialization practices in the area. Um, so we looked at a lot of metals um, just to kind of see this industrialization spike. Um, in the deep core, if you look at like the 63 centimeter, uh, there's a really steep increase um, around the industrialization time. And um, I really like to like look at the lead spike. There's you can't really see. There's no there's no lead present in the sediment, and then there's a very steep increase. This is we're thinking maybe like uh, leaded fuels and uh, lead paint being used um, on like homes around the lake, um, and then there's a really steep decline. Um, there's a steep decline on pretty much all the metals, um, which is good because we're thinking this is due to remediation efforts in the lake. So. And one of my favorite parts about this research is the amount of future research that we can actually continue to do on the same cores that we collected previously. One of the most important things that we were unable to calculate for ourselves yet was actually sediment accumulation rate of Canisius Lake. Previous research by the DEC showed a general accumulation rate of about 0.4 centimeters per year. This would be four centimeters of sediment being added to the lake bed per year. So based on that, we should have about 316 years of sediment, sedimentary history in our cores. With that calculation, we definitely see the colonization, industrialization, and remediation. But we want to calculate that for ourselves before we actually truly line up the dates. My future research is going to kind of focus on diatoms which are small silica fossils present throughout our pores. They give us a bunch of different references about the lake health and nutrition level of the lake. And I will be doing analysis on the sizes and population densities of diatoms in order to describe this in the future. 
Um, my future research will be evaluating the sedimentation rate of both the North and South Basin because um, our hypothesis is that the North and South Basin have different sedimentation rates. So I'm going to be doing XRD analysis, which gives you the abundance of certain elements throughout the core. And I'm going to be taking the different places, um, like the amount of elements and using a mathematical equation to find the sedimentation rate. And going to relate the sedimentation rate to human activity. Um, so I'm going to be looking at uh, phosphate concentration in the sediment um, and uh, possibly attributing this to land use practices that have happened uh, like over the lake. Um, and we want to thank the Canisius Lake Association for uh, them letting us use our boat and supporting us and then also the Genesee Geology Department. Um, I see your question in chat. We actually do not have access to the second monitor, so we cannot point it out out on the depth where exactly it is. If you look, you can kind of get the idea of a spike about three quarters of the way down on the deep core and half of the way down on the shell. Oh, wait. Yeah, uh, oh, you do. You, we do. So there you go. So you're talking about this yes. is the 110 centimeter spike. And then this is the 93 centimeter spike. So the 110, we see increase in magnetic particles which indicate that we have settlement from European colonization in the area. And then we have a higher spike, and this is usually after, more towards recent, that indicates that we have different types of land use practices that could be related to more industrial uses, such as trains and uh, other steamboats on the lake. Um, the most difficult part of your research and would you have done anything differently? Um, the, I mean, diatom digestion. The, probably. Yeah, the diatom digestion uh, was a long process. We had to uh, wear lab coats and face shields because it's a really dangerous <laughs> stuff. I could not have it touch our hands at all. Um, but I think it was more fun, <laughs> honestly, yeah. that way. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I think I think we did a pretty good job of yeah. this. Yeah, we're proud of ourselves. Your questions? Yeah, we're, we're proud of ourselves. <laughs> um, questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Trying to learn how to control the. All right, can everybody hear me okay? Um, so I'm Mike Chislock, and I'm going to introduce the next group. Uh, the next group was had a very exciting project where they were I'm looking at the invasion of starry stoneworts on Canisius Lake. So it was a hybrid SUNY Geneseo and SUNY Brockport group. So the two students that I have here are McKenna and also D. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you very much. Um, so our project was defining the ecological niche of starry stonewort alga early in its invasion. Um, of Canisius Lake. So Nidolopsis obtusa, which is better known to many as starry stonework, is a green macroalgae that's, algae that's native to Europe and Asia. Um, and it invaded North America only recently. Uh, and the native populations actually, what's interesting, consists of both male and female parts. But here in North America, only male parts are um, found. So that suggests that it's just been spreading through fragmentation and not sexual reproduction. Um, but here in Canisius Lake, it was first discovered in 2021 over the summer um, at the state boat launch. And then since then, the research uh, that has been done has found it all throughout the lake, lake indicating that it has actually been here for several years. Um, so our project's goal was to better understand the ecological distribution of it and the relationships of Star Stonewort in the lake. So for that, we asked three questions. And those questions were, first, what are the preferred habitats, uh, habitat depths? Uh, what other species of plants co-occur with the invasive and may be in jeopardy uh, due to the invasive expanding? And then finally, does the invasive tend to grow better near stream and sources of high nutrients 
or away from streams. So um, looking here at figure one, you can see the grid of uh, star stonework and those green dots represent where it was commonly found. That's just specifically the North End, but the whole lake is represented. And you can see that using Livingston County's, uh, the planning department's website, they, they made that grid for us, which was great. Um, and then in the pictures, you can see exactly what Starry Stonework looks like. That white part there is just the root of it and the uh, branching of the actual plant itself is on the picture to the right. Um, so for the methods of our research, uh, first, we used that website to find spots where the plant was uh, most commonly found, where locations where it was found. And then we used a rake toss uh, to collect samples of star stonework. Um, then we proceeded to find the exact depths where it was found and note its proximity to streams. And then our collections were sorted and dried. Some of them combusted for the percent dry weight and the percent organic content. And then our collaborators over at Brockport then and, uh, perform nutrient analysis on it to find the nitrogen and phosphorus content of the samples. So first, our question, looking at the preferred depths of starry stonewort. In figure two, you can see that the rake toss containing, the rake tosses containing starry stonewort were then organized by their depths. So um, it was found that the invasive was located in, all the way in shallow water to 15 feet deep, but most commonly it was found at five to seven feet. Um, and then moving down to figure three, that shows the presence and the absence of starry stonework based on the rake tosses that we did um, with respect to their depths. So the data was consistent with the lake-wide trends, but it showed a higher proportion of uh, collections at three to 12 feet. So then moving on to question two, what other plants is starry stonework associated with? So we can see from figure four that uh, after doing community analysis, that uh, slender naiad and sago pondweed were the species most commonly found living in the same habitats as starry stonework. Uh, but due to its small size and fragility, slender naiad was more likely to be outcompeted by starry stonework. And then finally, looking at question three here, is starry stonework more likely to thrive near or away from streams? Uh, figure five shows the dry weight or an organic weight competitions of star or compositions of starry stonework living in both near and away from stream locations. Uh, but contrary to our expectations, we actually found that there was not a significant difference in the organic content of the plants near and away from streams. So then after uh, our collaborators at Brockport performed the nutrient analysis, they also used the different proximities to streams uh, to represent their figure there in figure six. And that shows the total nitrogen and total phosphorus content of starry stonework at these different locations, at these five different sites. Um, but they also found that there was no obvious differences in total nitrogen and total phosphorus of the samples near and away from lake or of streams. So finally, to wrap this up, uh, for the depth distribution of starry stonework, it was commonly found between four and 10 feet deep. And this was unexpected because in its native range, it's actually found from 0.4 meters to 31 meters. And we thought that maybe this could be due to the turbidity or the cloudiness of Canisius Lake itself. So then for the species vulnerability, we found that Splendor Naiad was probably at the highest risk uh, while co-occurring in the starry stonework habitat due to overgrowth and competition of starry stonework. And then lastly, the stream association, though we did hypothesize that starry stonework would show elevated tissue, organic content, total phosphorus, and total nitrogen, there was actually no major consistent differences in the composition, in the tissue composition near and away from the streams. So that is our project. Do we have any questions? I have a question for you. Sure. It's going to be easier for me to speak it than type it. <laughs> um, so what I think I understood was um, that um, most of the starry stone was found between four and 10 feet deep, or was it meters? You said feet, right? Four to 10? It's feet. So it is located between four and 10 feet deep, uh, but right. in its native range, it was, it was meters. So two different measurements there. Other than, um, and it sounded like the maybe the speculation that the clarity of the water was one of the influencing factors. 
Yeah. Yes. Any other guesses as to why that four to 10 feet? Anything else other than water clarity? I'm just wondering. No, yeah, that's a good question. We don't specifically know, but I actually was just talking to someone out there about how maybe it has to do with the fact that Canisius Lake water level is able to be managed, but other places are not. So maybe that's another reason why it ranges so greatly in different areas um, and not Canisius Lake, but we, we don't. Well, there is another one too. Oh, sorry. sorry. Mm -hmm. um, Canisius Lake is uh, very turbid and turbidity has an effect on how much the light can penetrate down. And yeah. since it's so turbid, it's not able to go down as far. If the lake had, let's say, for example, very low turbidity, it says in our conclusion that in its native range, it could be 0.4 meters to 31 meters, which is obviously 31 meters is a lot farther than four to 10 feet. So in a very like low turbid or a very clear lake, it could thrive if possible. This is not necessarily related to your to your research. It's a little bit of a forward uh, guess, but any any projection on what you guys think will happen with Starry Stoneward in the lake? We specifically don't. It? Sure, no, um, we specifically don't know, but. Like we said about the other plant species, uh, slender naiad was most commonly found co-occurring and because, because of its structure and its fragility, it's likely that it could be outcompeted. So that's all we know so far. That's all we did research on specifically. But as for the future, we don't know because it is so early in its invasion in this lake. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Okay. Um, one of the questions that we have is what was the most difficult part of your research and what you would have done differently or anything differently? Um, the most difficult part is during our sampling, I'd say it was inconsistent on us getting um, the invasive species. We first started going out to the south end of the lake. And we were out there for six hours and got zero invasive species, which is like, it's pretty frustrating. And then one day we went out to the north end of the lake for an hour and a half and caught a majority of our samples. So, so it's just the inconsistency would probably be the most difficult part. Mm -hmm. And what we would do differently, probably just have maybe a more full representation of the lake if we could. If we had more time, I guess, to do samples, but just because of our restrictions with, you know, timing to get the boats out and, you know, with fall coming and everything like that and the plants dying off, we were limited on time. So that's probably what we would do differently. Yeah, yeah that, that would really be the only thing we could do differently. Um, another question we have here is, could this research be the basis of developing a health report card as a standard in the Finger Lakes? Any policy implications to be explored? That's, I, it's a good question, question. John. A good question. Um, I'm not sure if it could be the basis of developing a, a health report card for as a standard for the Finger Lakes, just because each ecosystem, each lake is unique in itself. As I said before, Canisius is uniquely turbid compared to some of the other Finger Lakes. I think this could be maybe a good precursor and it shows that something is happening in this Finger Lake, but I can't speak on what's happening to any of the other Finger Lakes. And I don't know if I want to apply this standard to other Finger Lakes in general. Mm -hmm. And for policy implications, I'm not sure about that either. I mean, I think it's good that for our project specifically, we're looking at early invasion and and with any invasive species, you want to be very um, adamant about trying to address it just because since it's in a foreign environment, it can come and it can just take over just like weeds in a garden. Like once it starts to grow, it can just spread like wildfire. Yeah, it would be great to use this as a um, standpoint for other lakes, like so that this doesn't happen to other Finger Lakes. Um, but as for policy, it would be great if that could be put in place, but I don't know. I don't know. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was great work. Yeah, thanks so much.
Okay, uh, so the next group we have is from SUNY Brockport. So we have Elena, Shannon, Siley, uh, Megan, and Holly, and they're going to be talking about the effects of aeration and also some of the effects they've seen on zooplankton in Lake Lacoma. All right, so to start off talking about the ecosystem of Lake Lacoma, Lake Lacoma is a eutrophic ecosystem, so it has high levels of productivity in the lake and kind of an overwhelming amount of nutrients, which means it's going to be very productive and produce uh, what we know as algal blooms. Uh, the main one that we're looking for, uh, which is an indicator of it being a very unhealthy ecosystem, would be the cyanobacterial uh, blue-green algae, which we can see in the lower left picture on the background information. So um, that's toxic to humans, toxic to animals, and so we can tell that that's probably something that we should end up getting rid of. So uh, one way to combat that is by adding aeration to the water column, because what would happen there would be the phosphorus would be trapped in the sediment and it would remain on the bottom. So um, in fall of 2016, they added aerators into the system in hopes of doing that, and it did clear up the problem. However, uh, duckweed then became a massive problem within the ecosystem. And so, yeah, we can expand on that in the graphs. So in zooplankton, in 2016, when there was still like an abundance of algae in the lake, um, we were seeing massive declines in zooplankton population. And this was because of the summer stratification during the time, and also because the bottom bottom layers of the lake was becoming increasingly hypoxic. So this hypoxia on the bottom of the lake was forcing the zooplankton up over time towards the surface level of the lake and causing them to be more visible to planktivorous predators. In 2019, when the areas have been introduced already, we saw a much more stable zooplankton population than earlier before. This, um, sorry. We saw a much more stable population, and this was because now that the lake was fully oxygenated, they were able to seek refuge in the bottom layers of the lake from predators. All right, yeah, so we'll start with their vertical profiles. Um, figure one is just a vertical profile of our radiance measurements. Um, so we couldn't find any data back in 2016, so the most that we could get was from 2017. Um, and between 2021, it had substantially increased at about four to two meters. Um, which just shows that how much light is actually penetrating the water. Um, and then for figure two, we have LDO has increased as well. Um, that also could be because of the duckweed that's forming at the surface. All the oxygen is kind of hanging up at the surface. And at eight meters, you can see that it's, I would consider it pretty hypoxic. Um, also could be because it happened really early fall. Um, so turnover probably hasn't occurred yet. So lots of things. And then kind of going into figure three, we're looking at those phosphorus levels from the pre-aeration back in June of 2016, and then also post-aeration in 2019. So pre-aeration, that's when all that internal loading was happening uh, in the bottom layers of the lake. And you can actually see that in the 2016 data as we're, it's relatively low at the top, the total phosphorus levels, but as you get down between four to six meters, it takes a really steep uh, increase in phosphorus which is also probably due to that internal loading at the bottom of the sediments. But then post aeration uh, in 2019, we actually saw a steady across the depths. It was pretty steady, roughly 250 parts per billion of total phosphorus, which may be a step in the right direction. But then we move over to figure four, where it has the vertical profile for extracted chlorophyll. And we see that back in 2019, which was still post aeration, but as Siley said, we couldn't get that data from 2016, unfortunately. We did see that there was a steady amount of chlorophyll all the way from uh, the surface to about roughly 10 meters below the surface. But as we get into those levels of duckweed coming into the system, we saw a huge spike in chlorophyll at the surface, particularly at the 50 uh, micrograms per liter there. And we think that the little spike that happens within the 2021 data roughly around six meters, 10 meters. We think that may have been due to some sort of instrument error. It could have been particularly windy that day. It could have been uh, due to wave action. So the instrument kind of fluctuates. 
But we actually wanted to shout out uh, Dr. Bosch, who's with SUNY Geneseo. We actually took um, a look at their literature cited across the years, and we were able to get a lot of that raw data. That was it. <laughs> All right, questions for the Lake Lacoma group. <laughs> How about if we ask the same question? What was the uh, most challenging part of your study? And would you guys have done anything different in your procedure? So a lot of our study was data mining because we weren't able to go out and collect data on our own due to um, a boat malfunction, unfortunately, which was quite the bummer. <laughs> so we're hoping to get out there this summer and actually collect our own data and see how the lake is looking. But um, that was a little frustrating. And it was uh, we wish that we were able to find more data on pre-aeration. But I'd say that was probably the most difficult part of our study. And if we were to go back, we would obviously have taken that data ourselves if we were able to. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was a little tough, especially when we were constructing these vertical profiles. Uh, we were only, unfortunately, we only found uh, raw data for 2017, 2019, and 2021. We did see, uh, we did, we were able to find total phosphorus raw data for that 2016 pre-aeration, but unfortunately, we weren't able to get uh, much else with the free aeration but we were able to kind of work with what we had we had a really great team working so definitely agree with megan though any other questions for the lake lacoma team <laughs> <laughs> I contact the chat. All right, thank you guys. Yeah, yeah thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, I'm not in the picture. It's just <laughs> okay. All right, so this is our final poster presentation of the evening. And this is another group from SUNY Brockport. Um, so we have Lexi and Nick here. And both of them are going to be talking about some of their work on Braddock Bay. So Braddock Bay had a barrier beach that was installed back in 2016, 2017. And they'll be talking about some of the implications of that barrier beach for water quality within this area. Yeah, thank you. Um, so a little background is they, uh, like Dr. Chislock said, they constructed this beach in 2016. And a handful of our graphs, uh, as you can see, show from 2015. And the idea was just to, to monitor the water quality behind um, the beach, uh, the barrier beach that was built, and uh, to see, you know, because like uh, Lake Ontario would hit the Braddock Bay area heavily with like wave action and things like that. And, um, you know, it would affect submerged uh, vegetation, emergent wetland habitat. And uh, we were just continuing on with the water quality checks uh, that the Army Corps of Engineers who built the barrier beach had uh, started. Yeah, so for our project, we chose five different sites within Braddock Bay. And we were kind of just looking at the water quality of these sites to determine the impact that the construction of this barrier beach um, has had on the nutrient content and the overall water quality within Braddock Bay and kind of farther back into the tributary of Buttonwood Creek that you can kind of see on the map in the bottom left. So we chose five different sites. One is going to be right at the opening of the barrier beach into Lake Ontario, one right directly behind the barrier beach, um, SG3 right back in the marina there. SG4 is going to be right at the mouth of that Buttonwood Creek tributary, and then another point um, farther back within Buttonwood Creek. Uh, the remaining three points that you can see on the map could not be accessed um, because of the winds on that day. We have really high winds coming from the north and northeast uh, that caused some pretty intense waves coming in from Lake Ontario uh, to the bay. And I mean, as you can see, we were in a canoe uh, so we sampled those sites via canoe uh, with a YSI, uh, basically just a probe that 
collects data for conductivity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, and things like that. Um, we also took two separate water samples at a meter depth. Uh, on the left, you can see me actually doing that. Um, and we analyzed those samples back in the lab. Uh, they were frozen, and we analyzed them at a later date. And we like basically run them through this nice machine, shows us what's coming out the other side. And those are the graphs you can see on this side of the, <laughs> I'm not sure which right, yeah, you're right or left. Um, so yeah, for our results, we um, you can see that 2015 data shows all of the pre-restoration nutrient levels. Um, and those were all kind of coming back pretty high, especially our NOx and total nitrogen levels. And then um, following the construction of that barrier beach in 2016 there, we really see kind of a drop off, off of these nutrients, especially with uh, NOx and total nitrogen. Total phosphorus, you can still kind of see some downward trends uh, with all of these nutrients. So for the day that we sampled, um, we actually found for NOx and total nitrogen, you can kind of see our concentrations increase a little compared to previous years with sampling, um, as well as also orthophosphate and total phosphorus, you can kind of see among all sites, uh, except for maybe Buttonwood Creek, we saw increases in these nutrient concentrations, um, which we weren't necessarily expecting, um, especially because there's been such really um, great data showing downward trends following construction of this barrier beach, but we do believe that as we were talking about, it was due to these high winds on the day that we were sampling. There was lots of mixing in the lake, um, and you can kind of see this reflected in our graph showing our LDO, which is going to be our dissolved oxygen in milligrams per liter throughout the bay. So we can see that back in Buttonwood Creek, there wasn't a whole lot of this dissolved oxygen. Whereas at SG5B, which is going to be right at the opening to the barrier beach into Lake Ontario, we can see higher oxygen, which kind of resembles this intense mixing that was happening due to high winds and waves that day. Um, as well as our specific conductivity, that kind of more represents what we were planning on seeing across these sites. Buttonwood Creek kind of having the highest concentrations of these different metals and nutrients, and then kind of a decreasing trend as you go closer to the opening of the lake. Uh, something I wanted to point out, our graph for NOx on the right there um, would be the bottom left of the four graphs. Um, the, the years that show no data are not that that wasn't collected, it was undetectable. So it is kind of weird to see that we have some detectable data, but again, we just attributed that to the mixing and the high winds and the later in the year. Uh, we, we did ours in November, most of the data was collected in September. Any questions? Yeah, that's all right. If there's any questions. What would be um what would be your future uh, or success of uh, research from jumping off of this? Where would you go next? I think we we would just recommend continued monitoring at this site. They're doing lots of post-restoration monitoring for all different aspects of this restoration and water quality is an especially important one we feel like because it kind of provides a domino effect for the rest of this system with you know nutrient uptake by plants which then affects fish spawning habitat and migratory bird habitat. So continuing to monitor this water quality I think is really important. Or anything else to say? Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so that's good. Well, that concludes our program for uh, for tonight. Um, I want to thank you. I know this this medium is a little bit challenging, but I want to thank you for uh, for your attention. I hope that. You learned some good things uh, from our students. And again, they're, they're just thrilled to have such an audience. And uh, this has been a, a really great celebration of research uh, in our lakes. And uh, we really do appreciate um, having you all here. And by the way, I'm Sid Bosch from SUNY Geneseo. 
And this is Mike Tislock, uh, the other culprit in, uh, in sponsoring these students. And you saw some of the work from uh, Jackie Malinowski from the uh, Geological Sciences Department at Geneseo. And she'll be coming back and giving a program in, I think Charlie has scheduled for March, a full program on this coring program, uh, this coring effort that she has uh, in Kenesha Lake. So, um, if Michael, yes. yeah, I just want to say thank you guys for attending. I know our students definitely appreciate the opportunity to share their work here. It's been nice to be able to um, have the students do some research projects in the fall, even with uh, the pandemic still going on. So, appreciate everybody taking time out of your schedules to be with us tonight and. Um, it's definitely a good experience for, for us to be here. We'll see you out in the lake next summer. Yep. Uh, thanks so much. Bye, everyone. I think uh, maybe we'll pass it on to Charlie now. If he, uh, it's still really noisy out there, so let's see if he wants to say so long.